has um, been kind enough to come in from California to do some sessions yesterday afternoon and then again this morning. Mohan is the founder of the Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, ASCA, and is medical director of the Bellwood Health Center in Bellflower, California. He specializes in treatment of abused children, adults and codependents, as well as, as, well as multi-generational family dysfunction. Dr. Nair challenges the misdiagnosis and mistreatment of these populations, and he has done remarkably uh, well in doing so, not only in training and consulting, but also he has a recent book out dealing with the survivor of child abuse, um, and uh, I understand that's going quite well. It's just been released in February, as I understand. Would you give a warm welcome, please, to Dr. Mohan Nair. Mohan. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Well, since we're working with limited time, yeah. Yeah. maybe about, uh, nine, about 9.35, about 9.45. Mm. 45. Okay. Yeah. 9.45, yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, so we're gonna go through some uh, slides real quick. There's about 10 slides, and uh, with your <coughs> photogenic memory, you're gonna get all of that. There's also some DSM-3 stuff, and I assume that everybody has the DSM-3 the third party payers must have forced you to buy it, so. <coughs> and then I have some overheads which I will show at the end. And if you have any questions, this time I mostly wrote out to keep myself cued because uh, I don't want to get too fragmented and make sure that I touch all the relevant points. So let's have the slides. Okay. Okay. Can we have the lights down? <coughs> this is uh, Goya's picture. It's because uh, it's an emasculation. Emasculation and terror is part of uh, a lot of domestic violence and uh, has a lot to do with the pathogenesis of dissociative disorders and uh, quote-unquote multiple personality disorder. And I'll tell you why I say quote-unquote so, later. <laughs> okay. This is... Uh, Cannibalism, I mean, I'm just making a reference to cannibalism and disemboweling and some of the very horrific experiences that people go through as a part of uh, having to deal with, uh, with uh, their later, later problems. I mean, just to take a look at what they have to go through. And uh, the fragmentation of mind and body and spiritual uh, sense that uh, takes place as a result of that wounding. And that so much of, of what happens in uh, abuse takes place at the body level. And if there's one thing that I have recognized or gone back and seen that I've done wrong or not done enough, it's in the area of not having done enough body work with uh, survivors, always, always. Okay. This is... Uh, the diagnostic criteria of post-traumatic stress disorder. And again, I mean, uh, we did this uh, thing with 30, 30 consecutive admissions uh, that were diagnosed as PTSD. And though they had several other hospitalizations, they had never been diagnosed as PTSD. The thing is, there seems to be a lack of uh, asking the questions in, uh, in terms of establishing the diagnosis uh, of PTSD, especially with psychiatrists. and. Um, to kind of disregard this whole process of wounding. And um, I was telling the, the workshop yesterday, I was at the PTSD conference uh, in New Orleans uh, several months back. And in four days, when uh, w they talked about uh, Vietnam veterans and industrial accidents and automobile accidents and uh, torture in South American political prisoners, all of which, of course, are very traumatic things, only four hours and four days was, was spent talking about what I consider the most pervasive and in, in a sense much more horrific uh, uh, abuse and uh, trauma, which is uh, the abuse of minor children and infants by, by the very people that are supposed to love and protect them. And uh, even uh, the psychogenic amnesia, which is really a part of uh, the PTSD syndrome, is almost never inquired into. And uh, if you look at the surveys that have been done, 
uh, the telephone surveys, uh, when large numbers of something like 27% of women and 16% uh, of men came up with uh, a history of sexual abuse in childhood, and they had admitted to the person on the telephone for the first time. And so, in a sense, society as a whole and individuals tend to have some degree of uh, dissociation and amnesia for trauma-related stuff. Again, you can look it up in the book. I just wanted to go through that. Yeah, these are two samples of writing by which I identify the possibility of dissociative states uh, in a patient. Uh, and um, much more than uh, just casual interviews, looking at handwriting and stuff like that can really give you insight into uh, diagnosing MPD. Same patient. artwork and uh, the experience of dissociation uh, in, in, t in terms of pictures and artwork. Oops, upside down, sorry. It's okay. It's uh, black and white candles and robed figures. And we'll touch briefly on uh, the ritual abuse thing, which you cannot talk about dissociation, PTSD, and, uh, and multiple personality disorder today without talking about uh, ritual abuse. And, and yet, you know, I cannot say I have, I have all the answers. I'm still struggling with the questions myself. Okay, next slide. Demons dancing at the foot of the bed. Next slide. An experience of uh, sexual assault. Okay, that's fine. All right, we'll have the lights here. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> You know, I mean, uh, the, the question always comes, like, is this a new phenomenon? You know, is MPD and dissociative disorders? Um, why is everybody talking about abuse? There's like this real resentment, especially among mainstream psychiatrists, about the fact that people are talking about this thing, and it, people other than themselves, that the community <laughs> at large <laughs> is talking about it, and somehow doing things and creating a movement. And there is a lot of resentment in fact, um, I, if you look at the la last uh, issue of, uh, of uh, Psychiatric News, there's a whole article, and Park Dietz, who's a forensic psychiatrist, uh, talks about uh, abuse and ritual abuse being all in the person's mind. I don't know, I cannot claim to know the full extent of all of this. And I'm sure that, uh, like, um, you know, there are many of you out there that are struggling with, with uh, some of this yourself, but um, I think I know enough to know that it's prevalent, especially prevalent in America. I don't think that the abuse of children, women and children, is something new. You know, it's extensively uh, there, documented in, uh, in the Judaic, uh, Christian, and other cultures, uh, where there's recommendations for raping little children. And uh, we didn't have to go to look at inhumane acts uh, towards Iraq or Cambodia, because uh, I think in the sixth century, uh, Genghis Khan uh, killed about six million people with sword and fire. He didn't, have, he didn't have napalm and gas chambers, but he did an efficient job. So inhumanity is not something new, but it's the, our inability to, to accept the fact that there is terror in our society, that there is a pervasive sense of terror, and there is a pervasive assault on our souls and our bodies and this earth, which in a sense is always connected to us, 
That is what we don't acknowledge and live with. I mean, we don't think about it like a sore on our body that tortures us all the time. We have uh, people with high IQ and master's degrees that sit in front of controls that are ready to launch missiles. And we think that we don't want to uh, be violent and get blood on our hands. We get our meat packaged in uh, cellophane in uh, the supermarket, but we, uh, don't th we think we are gentle because we don't kill animals, okay? So I don't want to get too tangential here, but um, why should uh, I assume, I'm making an assumption that most of the people that are here have some experience or interest uh, in uh, treating adult survivors. Uh, if, you're if you're treating chemical dependency <coughs> and dysfunctional families, you're treating adult survivors. I mean, uh, it's uh, witnessing violence, living in cold environments, having to go through threatened abortion in your, in your prenatal stage are all various forms of trauma, spiritual trauma, um, bodily trauma, all of that. <coughs> maternal depression. So I think my sense is um, that this is, we're working with wounded people. So anytime you have PTSD, you've got, you've got the potential for psychogenic amnesia because that is how very young children, infants, people, the earlier you go before the age of eight, I mean, in a clinical sense, what I've seen is the, the potential for dissociative, dissociative disorders and psychogenic amnesia increases. The closer the trauma is to people that are, that are close to home, caretakers, the more likely it is to be forgotten. Uh, and because you, you, how, do, how do you deal with being, uh, being molested and tied up and things like that by your stepdad in the middle of the night and then sit across the table, you like your cornflakes, and then go to school and be a five-year-old child or a four-year-old child, you know? So the need to develop dissociation, this armor that protects you so that your immune system and your body will not get overwhelmed and, and you won't want die an early death from some other reason. So my sense is anytime we're working with this population, we are looking at the possibility of working with uh, dissociative disorders and uh, multiple personality disorder. In my own work, I, I rarely use the term multiple personality disorder, especially because there has been like this whole movement of uh, multiple personality disorder therapists, that there are these individuals that have a special insight into multiple personality disorder, and they know that they have ESP and, uh, and uh, all this uh, s stuff. I mean, I'm not saying that ESP is not a possibility. I'm not saying that telepathy is not a possibility. I'm not saying, saying that um, past lives is not a possibility, but it's like if, if this past life is to be true, you'd, you'd be having a world full of Cleopatra's and Julius Caesar's, and I'm wondering where's the little black boy that died at the age of six, you know? So anyway, I think it's really, I think that anybody can work with, uh, with uh, multiple personality disorders. It's like working with other, any other wounded individual that you need a level of sensitivity and love and care and cherishing in, in therapy, that if you can honor them and hold them sacred and um, consider them as individuals, which I think if you get too involved in looking at MPDs, this, this MPD therapist mystique, which I hope I can undo some of that today, then puts a person either in awe, and you can't work you cannot embrace somebody spiritually or emotionally or feel close to them if you have them in awe. And there is too much therapists that hold their MPDs in awe. And once you are in awe of someone, you can't work with them. You cannot get on your hands and feet on the floor and work with them. It's hard because, because there's distance. Or, or the experiences are so intense that it's overwhelming and you disconnect from them. And you cannot see the wounding. They become objects of ridicule or they become circus animals. I mean, I know therapists that used to parade uh, patients and say, let me see alter so-and-so. Let me see alter so-and-so. It's like this whole circus thing. And I think this is really awful because we stop treating them as people that are wounded and uh, people that need love and care and respect. 
and uh, cherishing and uh, to be loved as individuals and carry, carry the sense of uh, being able to love them as we would uh, love children and something that they've essentially missed. <coughs> Historically, I mean, you know that uh, the physician Paracelsus, he was an alchemist and all this in the, in the 14th century, Swiss German. He talked about multiple personality disorders. I mean, he's given descriptions of multiple personality disorders. And uh, it was being, until Freud came along, and you can see, if you, read, if you read a lot of Freud's works, you can see that a lot of patients that he was dealing with, the so-called histrionic patients and stuff, are really people that suffer from dissociative disorders. The combination of conversion symptoms, uh, hist hysterical personality, and uh, all of that really fits what we now recognize as uh, dissociative disorders. So, incidentally, I, mean, I, I would just, in my own documentation, I usually describe MPD as dissociative disorder, not otherwise specified, and leave it at that because I mean, to me, it's, not, it's one form of dissociation. It's not something that is better or worse or more unique. I mean, somebody that has primarily migraine headaches has, uh, a, and periods of uh, memory lapses is not uh, more wo less wonderful <laughs> or, or less interesting uh, than somebody that's, got, uh, that's a concert pianist and got a master's in art therapy and has 56 personalities. I mean, this outdoing of how many personalities? I think it's really, I mean, to me, that's another form of dehumanization of patients. Anyway, uh, to come back to this. So, it is the impact of the diagnosis of schizophrenia and the impact of uh, medications like uh, Thorazine that has really uh, pushed the, the diagnosis of dissociative disorders uh, behind. Morton Prince has written in the, in the earlier part of the 20th century about uh, dissociative disorders and, and MPD-like uh, syndromes. It's very interesting that uh, Roy Grinker, have you heard of Roy Grinker? He's written a book on, he, he's a psychoanalyst, he's a neurologist, but um, he's written a book on psychosomatic concepts. Very, ni very nice. Anyway, <laughs> he was one of the people that advocated uh, the use of uh, memory recall and ab reaction in World War II right after people would um, be traumatized. The so-called battle shock in First World War and, and, con and uh, the PTSD forms of World War II, but they would essentially take people uh, off the lines and, and do ab reactive therapies with them, including sodium amytal interviews uh, with them, because he felt that the more you let the trauma and the affect of the trauma and the memories of the trauma and the bodily states of the trauma in your system, the more entrenched it gets and then the more likely that it will then f start finding other symptoms, whether it is chronic sleep disturbances or avoidance of eye contact in public or uh, not being able to be sexually active or hold people or whatever, or having uh, flashbacks or whatever. Uh, so dealing with the trauma, uh, quickly it was, but then as it is written up in, uh, in the 1950s, we've, we found uh, something came from up there, which is from Switzerland, which is Thorazine. And uh, so in Vietnam, they found out that you didn't have to treat, treat uh, battle shock because you could give, as the journal says it, 1,000 milligrams of Thorazine would completely stop the symptoms. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, and then maybe five years later, ten years later, I mean, we are so aware now that, that combat veterans uh, have uh, delayed PTSD. You know, I, when I, my interest in PTSD and uh, dissociative disorders really came out of my work with the veterans back in 77 and 78 and 80 when I was at the VA, and uh, I really feel blessed by the fact that I got a chance to work with that. And. Um, it was like if they, the political attitude back then was they rarely diagnosed PTSD and um, you usually diagnose them as uh, antisocial personality disorder. If they're older, you diagnose them as gomers, you know, get out of my emergency room, you know, if you heard the term, because they were considered a botheration and you didn't treat them as people with souls. 
you know, it, it was a very abusive attitude in the VA. And uh, I found out, I, I had written a paper back then where people would simply diagnose veterans as um, antisocial personality disorder without sticking to any criteria that define antisocial personality disorder almost all the time, whereas when it came to things like schizoid personality and stuff, they stuck to it uh, a lot more. So there is obviously a lot of counter-transference issues there that, uh, that are not being dealt with. So, but there, so there is a reason why if, if you don't look at the possibility of MPD in your patients and dissociative disorder in your patients, they're going to find some because your cure will not be, your work will not be in depth and they will eventually find somebody that may not be any better than you and may rob them off their home and their, uh, I mean, the amount of sexual abuse survivors and, and MPDs that have been abused by their therapists is massive. Because we deal with a program that uh, deals a lot with uh, this kind of problem. We get a lot of people that have been abused by, by the therapists again and again. I mean, not just with one therapist. So, so we don't have to, you've heard of Jerry Kersenbach, right? He was, uh, the, he was the president of the MFCC uh, organization. But I mean, he was sexually involved with uh, one of his patients the year before last, and they paid out like $3 million. But again, I, I have, I have, I don't want to sound like this great person. Uh, I think that sexual abuse of uh, patients is a problem. We need to look at it as a problem among therapists because lots of therapists are wounded people. We need to carry passion to therapy, but I think it's when the passion takes the form of sex, sexual, because of, of the unresolved problems of sexuality that then we hurt patients. Passionless therapy I don't think helps anybody. And the reason why uh, psychoanalysis <laughs> and other forms of passionless therapy doesn't uh, work is because uh, you never address the human inside uh, the patient. <coughs> so I think recognizing the MPD is important because then you, can, then you can adopt technical things that can address the person's problem. I think it's like treating every other wounded person, whether the person is sexual sexually deviant person uh, that has voyeurism or uh, any one of the other uh, perverse behaviors or self-mutilators, uh, quote-unquote borderline personality disorder. And I say these things with a meaning because, I mean, I think, and I think a lot of you may already be in tune with the literature, but I think most people that we describe as borderline have been through a protracted period of terror within the relationship of their infancies and have re never really gotten over it and this is how they display it and uh, when I was at UCI we were told like you got to just make sure you don't talk to them too much you know I mean if you spend time with them I mean you know they just eat you and uh, you make sure you don't see them for more than 15 minutes we used to be given this list of undesirable borderline patients that you should not see them, you know, somehow the moment they hit your ward, try, try from triage, just get them out. And it's really, I mean, I think a, a really terrible, unempathetic attitude. And I think many, many of the patients that we've, uh, that suffer from quote unquote borderline personality disorder, in fact, suffer from dissociative disorders and um, possibly forms like MPD. I think a lot of people with schizophrenia. Um, I know for myself that uh, early on I've diagnosed people that are schizophrenic as, uh, MP uh, um, that are, are MPD as schizophrenic. And uh, I think lots of bipolars tend to get diagnosed as, uh, as um, uh, you know, MPDs tend to get diagnosed as bipolars. And I can look back and look at all the mistakes that I, that I have made. The other thing is uh, because of this combination of extreme trauma and the extreme courage that the person, the spiritual strength and the courage in individuals that have gone through the wounding, the kind of internal resources and the spiritual strength that they carry and that we are in touch with when we work with them is so wonderful that uh, it's very enriching experience. I mean, to me, one good reason is that it's a, it is uh, abuse-related problems, including PTSD, um, 
also deviant sexual behaviors, dissociative disorders, and, and MPD are such treatable problems. I think uh, once you conceptualize it and start working with people, you make such big strides in, getting, in having them get better, and so much through their own resources, without hospitals, without treatment programs, with the use of the 12 step, with the use of their own creativity, the capacity to write poetry and exercise and, and uh, love and you know, nurture and all of these things that it's just nice to see people, people get better. I tell people all the time, it's not, I don't have any special fondness for, uh, for victims, you know, or abuse survivors. I mean, to me, somebody that I would meet at the ball game is just as sacred as somebody that I see in the hospital. Uh, and, you know, once you have gone through an experience of uh, doing, uh, I did surgery when I was, uh, before I went into psychiatry, and you are confronted with your powerlessness when you see young children uh, die deaths of prolonged pain. And uh, it kind of, uh, you don't go in with the same altruism, but it, it's common sense in treating dissociative disorders and not misdiagnosing them, because if you diagnose them correctly, they're going to get better. Anyway, I think the most important thing then is you've got to diagnose it and um, to recognize a multi-generational uh, problem. And in, because it's multi-generational, doesn't mean it's genetic, because you go from one cold, unstable, uh, affect-denying uh, environment to another, uh, you, you learn these things, especially when they pass on in a nonverbal way, as we see in alcoholic, uh, violent homes, homes of domestic uh, uh, sexual uh, boundary loss. Okay. There is always trauma, there is always amnesia, and much of the time there is violence and sexual violence, but also non-violent non, uh, uh, sexual seductions um, uh, with uh, both parents, uh, step-parents, and extended family members. Uh, I think in history taking, it's very, very important to look at the strengths, the capacity to play, the spiritual uh, uh, capacity, what were, the, what were the bright and shining figures, the warm figures in the individual's life, what kept them alive through these experiences of horror, what were they thinking about as they lay in bed in their, in their pain and their misery and their aloneness uh, when they were staring up at the ceiling, where did they go, who did they play with, their imaginary companions, all of that physical examinations, looking for scars, looking for dysautonomic symptoms. Because there is al always, any, I mean, some of the patients will give history of hypertension that comes with periods of time, but they often diagnose as uh, generalized anxiety disorder, panic attacks, stuff like that, because of this dysautonomia. Because when your uh, subconscious, when your, when your limbic system is overloaded with stuff that you cannot find words and pictures, and, and you cannot dream, and you cannot fantasize, then it kind of begins to upset your autonomic nervous system. But also, as you begin to move memories and affect, people will start getting autonomic destabilization, like migraine headaches, uh, blood pressure changes, wanting to go to the bathroom, incontinence. This is all part. I mean, you may have a perfectly nice realtor the, who comes into your office at 45, and in, in uh, three weeks' time, she's a wreck, and she's incontinent all over the floor and can't sleep and is terrorized and is hallucinating and you don't have to think you're necessarily in the wrong track, okay? Because maybe this explains why she has been with a, a bum for the last uh, 40 years who's been beating her up. So anyway, <coughs> so physical examination, looking for scars, all of this thing, urogenital, urogenital injuries, the history of especially uh, pelvic, uh, pelvic cysts, uh, endometriosis. I'm not saying that every person with endometriosis has been sexually abused. Now, please not, I mean, since this is going to be a fast talk, I don't want to make, uh, uh, you know, I don't want you to make those assumptions. Psychologic testing is, you know, almost always gives you no real information about MPD. It, uh, it shows you a, a picture of schizophrenia a lot of times. Uh, and in, in a sense, it's right because it shows fragmentation. But things that you may have shifts in uh, psych testing, like especially in IQ and things, there might be shifts. <coughs> EEG, spectrum, we're doing some work with some of this. But there are no diagnostic answers. You can sometimes rule out things like temporal lobe epilepsy when you do some of these, these uh, nuclear medicine uh, scanning tests and things like that. Uh, 
Okay, the differential diagnosis. I've written down, written down everything, including looking like normal. So, <coughs> I'm almost at the end of my time here. So, I'd, but basically, it can look. Uh, the commonest diagnosis again is major depression. You have uh, you have anxiety phobic symptoms. Uh, they they can present as uh, uh, substance abuse problems, uh, anything from heroin to speed, cocaine, amyl nitrate, glue, hallucinogens, pot. Okay. They can be diagnosed as schizophrenic on the basis of, of hallucinations. Hallucinations, but the texture of the hallucinations is different. You can find every kind of hallucination, uh, uh, but, but um, it, is, it is very important to follow up on the hallucinations. You can have internal voices, external voices, voices of children, uh, and uh, and um, a sense of this, uh, looking at the self from above. You, know, you, you kind of have to look at all this, this range of depersonalization and what, what is described as autoscopic hallucinations and negative hallucinations, uh, like what's described in the, in the, by Bianchi in the Hillside Strangler. The thing is, this is another, I mean, it's such a political thing. I've had people tell me, I have watched the film of Bianchi several times. And I do believe he has a dissociative disorder, but it's not politically correct for the forensic psychiatrist to say that Bianchi was, uh, had a dissociative disorder. I, do, I don't think that just because Bianchi has a dissociative disorder, he shouldn't pay. I think that people that have dissociative disorders are as accountable as everybody else because you never wake up with blood on your hands one fine day. There is a sequence of events, things that you see or should be seeing that have not been accounted for. You have lapses in time, you have, to, when your life feels empty, when you have intense mood swings, when you cut your wrist, when you brought up and down by 50 and 60 pounds, when you cannot be sexually active, when you find that your bo boyfriend or husband for the third time molests your child, you got to think that something's wrong. So you don't, it doesn't have to be that you, the first time you think you got MPD is because you killed your boyfriend for, for uh, being beat up, okay? I mean, in that kind of situation. So. I think accountability is very, very important, and this is where I have a disagreement with many MPD therapists because we have to take accountability. So every dream, every bodily memory, every uh, physical pain, every mood swing has to be, what's the term in uh, the 12 steps? You've got to take inventory of everything in our lives as a part of looking at a dissociative symptom in people that uh, have abuse-related problems. This is the end of side one. Please stop now and turn your cassette over for side two. Hallucination have been a real reason why people have diagnosed MPD as uh, schizophrenic. Because for most psychiatrists, if you go and tell them you hear voices, you don't even have to tell them. Because, I mean, if you look at it, 100% of the population hallucinates at some time. Okay? Very definitely. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you just have to think about it. And, uh, but if you go to a psychiatrist's office and tell him that you hear voices, he's going to pull out his prescription pad. So, because of the, because of the risk, of being hit with very dangerous medication. Because people that come from a background of violence, and especially men that come out of a background of violence, are more prone to becoming violent. See, people that come from a background of violence have illnesses that are, that are psychiatrists can't tolerate. Many mental health professionals can't tolerate. It's not nice, see? They just don't sit on the couch and talk for endless time. And it is this abhorrence of deviant sexual behavior, quote unquote agitation, uh, all of these things, violent, violent behaviors, suicidal uh, thoughts and feelings that they feel so helpless that then they have to hit them with medications, except that these medications are so damaging. I got into this whole field of, of working with adult survivors 
because of my intense agony at seeing bright and creative people being knocked out with neuroleptic medications, which I think are the most dangerous medications. If you don't know, one out of 100 people that get treated with neuroleptic, uh, with neuroleptics, okay, anti antipsychotic uh, medications like Melorel, Thorazine, Salazine, Haldol, Folixin, none of them is better than the other. Navain, um, all of these, they're all, they all ca cause some degree of brain dysfunction, attacks the limbic system, attacks the, the basal ganglia, takes away the a person's sense of creativity and soul, causes their muscles to tighten up, they start feeling like freaks, they cannot keep, uh, they feel very restless, but four, over 4,000 people in the United States die every year from taking neuroleptic medications. I mean, this is something that most people don't know. Neuroleptic malignant, neuroleptic malignant syndrome kills 4,000 people in the United States every year. Okay? There is a 60% chance, there is anything from a 13 to 60% chance of getting irreversible tardive dyskinesia if you take neuroleptic medications. And if you look at somebody that's been on neuroleptic medication, and they'll tell you anytime you take it over three months, you have a chance of getting it. And nobody can tell you that just because you're 18 and you took it for two and a half months, you're not gonna get it. It doesn't mean you gotta be 60 years old and take it for three months. We don't know these things. We only know that if you have a restless movement of the tongue, something's ir seemingly irreparably damaged in your brain, okay? I don't believe it's irreparably damaged. I think that you gotta stop hurting it and the brain has a tremendous capacity to heal. So I don't feel so hopeless about it. But uh, what it does is, it, it's not just the movement of the tongue, there is a loss of the person's soul, their creativity, and that is what we don't see. So it was, that is what got, it, got me into working with abuse survivors, trying to halt this medication. Between, 19, between the coming on of the Republican government and Ronald Reagan, there's been a, the, the production of Ritalin has doubled from 1,500 kilograms to over 3,000 kilograms. See, there is this medicating of society. I mean, it is, to me, it's the most insulting, horrible thing, and there is a need to waken up and look at it. I mean, uh, there is a real, I hate to talk about thoughts in this ritual abuse MPD conference, but, uh, but it's like a real thought between the managed healthcare companies and conservative mainstream psychiatrists about medication. In fact, if you look in the April, April 1990 issue, there is an Osterhoff versus Chestnut Lodge case where Gerald Clerman stresses that if you don't use medications, these major psychiatric disorders, you are liable for malpractice. That means if your patient dies or sues you, then and that medications are the only proven way to treat psycho psychiatric emotional uh, disorders. Okay? Anyway. Am I going too fast? <laughs> All right. Anyway, it can present, you know, as I've discussed in my book, any abuse-related problem can present as any mood problem, any thought disorder, any thought, switching can often look like thought disorder, switching can often uh, look like a rapid, rapid, rapid shifting mood. So, dissociative states can mimic mood disorders, uh, dissociative states can, can uh, mimic paraphilic disturbances, uh, and uh, a lot of physical uh, disorders like migraine headaches, uh, pelvic problems, colitis, uh, can be accompanied with uh, dissociative uh, symptoms and should make us think about abuse. Okay, in terms of treatment, self-help is the most important uh, way to, I mean, to me, it is the most important way to, uh, to, to treat people. I think that all therapy should focus towards self-help and that if we are not helping people move towards self-help, then we are betraying them. Either we are doing that consciously or that we are doing it unconsciously. I think that anytime you're looking at therapy where a patient absolutely has to have her his or her therapist after a period of a year is looking at the possibility of enabling. I think that one has to get the person to work the program honestly. And the second thing is body work. If there is one area that I feel I have not done enough, it's in, it's in body work. And to me, the, the, the spiritual wound and the wounding of the body, the fragmentation of the body, is like the most, the most painful, most uh, severe wound that has, not, that has not been worked through. 
And uh, it is also something that, because so much of us live in our own head, that we don't address adequately in our patients. Of course, you know, you got this whole no touch thing. And I'm not saying, I generally don't touch patients. If, uh, if somebody, if I, I'm not saying that I never give a hug, but I, I don't give massages to my patients, all of that, okay? Uh, but we have people that are designated. I think it is important for this modality of treatment to be used, and people must be directed towards using. People with dissociative disorders who live in their head and create boxes inside boxes inside boxes need to get out of their heads and live in their bodies and reconnect their abdominal pains and their incontinence and their back pain and their migraines to, their, to the terrors of their childhood and put it all together and heal themselves. So the body work is absolutely important. Bo by body work, I mean using the body as a vehicle both for uh, getting in touch with feelings as well as heal as, as a healing experience. So bringing on memories as well as healing the memories by positioning, by touching, by, uh, by whatever, you know, bioenergetics, uh, shiatsu, uh, holding, just plain holding, dance, all of this to kind of recapture the essence of uh, celebrating body movements, of nurturing body sensations. I mean, I don't think that somebody that remain sexless without sexual activity for for years and years into quote unquote recovery uh, that is that that doesn't play and exercise and run and stuff like that in a sense is really in recovery because they are still not recovering in their body and their and their pain is just being put in another little cubby hole. Okay. So uh, a good history including using hypnosis during, uh, of to uncover the his the the wounding. I think it's really, from the start, you work at it, and, and it's like a no holds bar thing. You, you can never do too much. I mean, this, I think the real myth is that somehow you're going to bring on something that you cannot handle. The more I have worked with getting memories out fast, I should have started doing this early on, okay? A lot of times, it's the therapist's own inability to, to, to consider themselves as being a container to provide the soothing, containing environment that will allow the person to reintegrate feelings of terror and anguish and suicidal states into their to total sense that holds them back. And it's, see, because if you've handled this as a three-year-old child, if you handle the terror as a three-year-old child, you can bet that with your increased cognitive capacity, your increased skills, creat creativity, social support at the age of 45, you're going to be able to do it, okay? But it is when therapists think that no, you don't have to. If you feel frightened to going to ISC meetings, don't do that. If you don't want to go to body work because you feel nauseous, don't do that. I'll just give you two more sessions a week. I mean, it's that attitude that I think holds back people from recovery a lot of times. Okay. Again, I think that one has to see the wound of the soul, the mind wound as in the cognitive wounds, the distortion of reality, the heart wounds as in emotional wounds, and the body wounds, and, and treat it all together. Um, treating a person as sacred, as we should treat everything on this earth as sacred. Empathizing them as individuals, cherishing them as individuals, holding them as and protecting them and being consistent, mirroring them and challenging them. Because if you go along with every crazy thought in their head, which they're going to come up with, you're not doing them any good. Okay, name game. You know, I, I think it's not, I think mapping is very important. I mean, if you want, I can go into what mapping is, if you, you know, if you talk one on one. But I think mapping is good, but if, if you say, I just like the ones that have all this, I like the concept pianist that comes nicely dressed, but I don't like the one that dresses in the bag and looks down at the ground or sits in the corner of the room. I don't like that person. If your body language and your tone of voice doesn't hold somebody that eats boogers the same way as somebody that likes to, uh, you know, play music and give you all these nice little cassettes that they made for you, you're hurting them. I mean, you are not taking the fullness of the person and you're putting them through the same kind of wounding that maybe every other therapist and their parents have put them through. So, there is need to, to bring on inter-alter communication. I often have them tape sessions because they're going to forget sessions and have them listen to it later. A lot of emphasis on memory work, huh? As uh, Jung has said, I don't know if he said exactly this, but what you don't work through in your unconscious memory, you live as faith. So, I think it's very, very important. I, I think it's absolutely important to try to get memories, both body memories, emotional memories, and cognitive memories. 
and asset building. So it's like when people come in feeling great and wanting to have a nice chat because you're in a good mood and they're in a good mood, you kind of take them back into the pain. And when they're coming with a lot of pain, you take them into their, uh, their play playful part and, and, uh, and the courageous part. Okay. There, uh, I had spoken to somebody yesterday and we had this thing about AT. You know, we don't do enough AT. I feel we don't do enough AT on, in the way that I work, but I feel activity therapies, ancillary therapies are absolutely essential. Therapists to try to carry the load of abuse dissociative MPD type are fooling themselves, they're not serving the patient adequately. Ancillary therapies, uh, art therapy, uh, movement therapy, dance therapy, activities, just playing is absolutely essential, both for diagnosis because it can give you all kind of pointers as well as in, as in treatment. Uh, again, I feel that, and again, a lot of people in the recovering community don't agree with me, and of course, most of the psychiatrists don't, but they're kind of coming around, and there is more and more documentation that dissociative disorders can be helped by the use of narco analysis, uh, including amitol and brevitol interviews, which we do a lot of times when other avenues have been exhausted and the patient is really doing everything. I don't wait for another 10 years of abusive lifestyle and possible suicide to say, I think now I should help the person get their memories. Uh, as long as the person's working the program, including doing a good top step work, I think it's okay. I have not seen an increase in symptoms. I have not seen an increase in, uh, in uh, the capacity to, uh, to relapse, because a lot of people say uh, you cannot do uh, Amitol or Brevitol uh, interviews because they're addicts and somehow that's going to uh, knock them back. It's, it, it simply doesn't happen. They move on to second stage recovery, if you know the use of the term, and do the inner child work, you know, much faster. And they are into a much tighter level of integration a lot earlier, and they don't have to wait you know, through many more years of torture. Okay. Uh, suicidal states, self mutilation, uh, going AWOL, um, are very, very important. Hiding in closets are very, very important and we need to therapeutically address this. One needs to be mindful of this in, in treating them. It doesn't mean you get to rush them into the hospital because there's always a very strong preserving self. I think I wrote down the last thing, the triumph in personality. You know, we talk about borderline personality, all these things. I think more than anything else, the most important thing that I want from patients is to make a commitment to start working on it. So it cannot be, they can build up to it. And it's a question of establishing safe distances. I mean, any time you have a patient that comes and says, she went to a male massage therapist and she took off her clothes and got this great massage, I'm always worried, you know? I mean, obviously there's great cause to worry, but it's really working up to it. Just like uh, because these people have been violated, uh, or the only way that they know to connect to people is sexually, a lot of times, uh, it has to be approached with great care. Yes. Self-abusive behaviors, uh, you mean like self mutilation Well, or even developmentally disabled. You know, it, it is too long for me to go on into this, but I got to tell you my experience. I worked at the Developmental Evaluation Clinic in Boston, Children's Hospital, and one it was really what, it made me recognize that you can be born tremendously brain damaged. You can be born with XYYs and XOs and all these genetic abnormalities, but you can grow up to be a wonderful human being if people give you the right kind of environment. So I would see people all the way till they were 18 years old that had been diagnosed with severe brain injuries and, and uh, metabolic, genetic metabolic disorders that were wonderful people. And then it's like this XYY thing that you heard many years ago, violent personality. I mean, it was all a myth, you know? I mean, there's nothing, I mean, the power of love within individuals and outside is so strong. I mean, it's, uh, so, uh, so I, I don't know. I think that there are many people that are possibly suffering from dissociative disorders that, that get labeled as autistic and all of that. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I cannot say if it's uh, just eight year, uh, eight year old. I think that, the, to me, it's just like a rough cut off line. Uh, I think that, um, that uh, people can have amnesia. I mean, matter of fact, if they have amnesia at 12 and 13 and 14 and 15, to me it's even a larger, a larger clue that, uh, that something serious is going on. 
But it seems that the earlier the abuse is, the more likely they are to, to kind of have a heightened, uh, heightened dissociative uh, defenses. Yes. The question is, uh, uh, do you have to capture all the memories? I don't think you have to capture all the memories, but I think you have to, you have to work with the most uh, painful, uh, painful ones, as well as with the very positive ones. Um, you got to work with, you got to work with, with the very polarized elements within the person. And uh, I th a lot of times, and, and that ha I feel very strongly that has to be done. And I was talking earlier with one of the people here. A lot of times when people avoid confrontations, uh, as in confronting abusers, whole blocks of memory, whole personalities in a sense, are never dealt with. So one of the reasons why people don't recover fast enough and, and become asymptomatic is because uh, they don't work with uh, a lot of the memories because making the contacts to work those memories is too difficult. Uh, and we cannot, uh, we cannot, we cannot conspire in their helplessness. I'm going to stop now because it's uh, 10 o'clock, and I was told. Uh, but I, but I'll, I will be here for uh, later, and uh, you know I'll be, I'll be attending the rest of the stuff here. So feel free to contact me.